So, I am here with somebody I consider a mentor. I've been studying you for, for many, many years. So thank you, Mr. Michael Leachin. We would introduce you as the chairman of the Economic Growth Council for Jamaica, but you're also the, the chairman and founder of Portland Holdings, which has quite a lot under there. Your flagship is, is NCB, the largest, would it, you said the largest bank in the Caribbean? One of the in, ter largest. in terms of uh, profits. In profits. Well, yes. that's, I think that's the best way to measure, <laughs> to measure banks. So, so I've known you now for a number of years. I consider you a mentor, as we've talked about. And every time we've spoken, you've given a framework that I felt was important for people to, to understand about creating wealth and talking about investing in our region. I remember you specifically said that and there were three things that we have to be looking for. One was perception must be different from reality. And number two, you yeah, specifically said that we need to be looking at inefficiencies must exist. And then number three is that there should be a lack of risk capital. Did I get that right? Perfect. Oh, but all right. Eight I can go home now. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to start speaking anymore. You have the narrative down perfectly. Well, I mean, <laughs> based on that, we you know, we created Blue Moho Partners wanting to invest in the Caribbean with Jamaica as a beachhead. Having seen what you have done, you invested here in Jamaica and then you've gone to the rest of the Caribbean, but you also invested in India. We tend to think of Jamaica as India, say 15 years ago or, or even more. We are about to do some things here. And we first really met when you were showing me your Portland India fund. I think many people don't know that you had invested in Infosys of our companies in 2002. Bunja Ports and the says Special Economic Zone in 2007, Adani Power, to, I mean, we, we can go on and on. How do you see similarities between India then that made you invest and then Jamaica now and what we are doing here? Well, well David, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, we are, as you mentioned, the, the, there are three preconditions that are most important to us before we really get excited about a wealth creating opportunity. Okay. The first, as you mentioned, is there must be a difference between perception and reality. The second is there must be inefficiencies. And the third is there must be a lack of equity capital flowing into the region, the area, the sector. India, it was now 15, 17 years ago, uh, when we were doing the, trans the IT transformation of the bank, uh, my first board meeting, Pricewaterhouse, we had just bought a bank, first board meeting, Pricewaterhouse came in and said, look, we've done a, 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 an audit on the back office IT infrastructure and it's very late. <laughs> and it's going to cost you $100 million and five years to try and totally change wow. it out. So I said, what? A hundred million? Well, we, we just bought a bank. Wow. This is an ambush. Right. We do have 100 million. And we do have five years. Because after, if you're saying it's derelict now, after five years, before five years, it will be dead. Right. So there's less risk in just doing a big bank conversion right now. So we sought, we went to England, we went to New York, and we went to India to find vendor partners. <clears throat> we came across this company in India, in, in, in emphasis in India. And we said, look, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is the price we've been offered. This is what we can afford, 50 million. Uh, do you want a job? And by the way, you'll never have an opportunity to do another bank conversion, IT conversion, bumper to bumper, because no other bank is going to take that risk. Banks are conservative. This one, where it's less risky to do what we're proposing than to maintain uh, the, the, the status quo. So they said, yes, we need to take it on. So they and they, within six months they did the conversion. Wow! So I thought, and that gave us an opportunity to have worked with Infosys. Exactly. So I thought, as I now put my asset management cap on because I'm a money manager. Right. I started off in money management, and I thought this is a wonderful business because at the core, uh, you invest in things you understand. Having worked with Infosys for six months. We you now understood them from the out, inside right. out. So we started accumulating shares in Infosys. We eventually became the largest shareholder of Infosys outside of the founders. Right. This was 17 years ago. We all know what Infosys yeah. has done. Yes. <laughs> so that gave us our, our, our taste of investing in Infosys specifically, but also investing in India. Why we were comfortable with India? Because we asked one question. 
And if we can't get past this question, we're not, we're not going. The question is, would I be confident standing in front of a judge in this country that I'm thinking of investing in? If the answer is no, I'm not investing. They must respect ownership. India has a British legal framework. I feel comfortable with, 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 I, uh, with, with, with the framework. So we've been all started hunting for more assets in India. And we came across Adani, uh, sorry, Mundra ports, which became Adani port. We went again, started accumulating. Uh, and we became one of the largest shareholders of Mundra slash Adani, and then Adani power, etc. So what we saw in, in India, we saw uh, the, the, the three preconditions be met. Right. Right? So we now come to Jamaica. Jamaica in 2002, when I bought a bank, those three preconditions were in spades. Spades. And nobody right. wanted the bank. <laughs> nobody wanted the bank. So you just, if, if you're in North America, you don't perceive of Jamaica as a nirvana for investing. But if you're a Scotia bank yes. who invested in Jamaica, in fact, Scotia came to Jamaica in 1889. Before it went to Toronto, right? It was Halifax here. Exactly. In Toronto. Yes. yes. Uh, so if you're a Scotia Bank, you know what the margins are in Jamaica because Scotia in 2001, the year before we bought NCB, uh, there are Scotias in 50 countries. Scotia International, which is in 49 countries, right. minus Canada. <coughs> uh, Jamaica, although they're in 49 countries in 2001, Jamaica provided Scotia International with 25% of its after-tax earnings. Wow. So they knew, they knew <laughs> what the, uh, the, the realities are in Jamaica in terms of a great investment. Right. Scotia Global, in 50, the whole Scotia, in 2001, 8% of their after-tax earnings came from Jamaica. So that's a perception reality difference. Most of us in, in North America, we just not see Jamaica as an investment nirvana. Wow. The, uh, principle number one. Second principle, that, 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 that precondition that has to be there before we get really excited is that there must be inefficiencies, whether it be regulatory inefficiencies, whether it be mispricing inefficiencies, whether it be <clears throat> just operational inefficiencies, financial inefficiencies, but there must be inefficiencies. And when there are inefficiencies, you have an opportunity to buy inexpensively and convert from being inefficient to efficient. And it's in that transformation, you get a huge wealth lift. And the third precondition is there must be a lack of equity capital. Because when you are in an environment where there's a lack of equity cap capital, every incre incremental dollar is hugged, is loved, right. is kissed, right? right. The converse is when you invest in countries or areas where there's a lot of capital, that incremental dollar is useless. It's a commodity. Right. Right? So yeah. you don't want to be there because uh, uh, when there's a dearth of equity capital, it means that you can buy inexpensively and margins are much better. You can pick and choose versus yes. we. So, so I keep saying to the, the family office we meet with that we have. Everybody is chasing yield now because we have a, a zero interest rate or even negative interest rate environment between the US, Canada, and, and the EU. And so the opportunities aren't there. And, and so having worked in private equity in the US, we saw prices skyrocketing, which you would know because people were paying 10 times, 14 times. There was too much money chasing deals versus here in Jamaica, we don't have as much money chasing those kinds of deals. So you think we have fairer prices or better prices? But you think it's a great place for us to get yield? So, uh, firstly, yield. Uh, interest rates have come down in Jamaica significantly. Right. So the uh, the, 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 the Bank of Jamaica's uh, rate today is one point two five percent, reflecting inflation, uh, and it's not expected to go up to. Uh, to uh, uh, significantly. In fact, the problem now is we have too low inflation. Too low inflation. Uh, so yield has come down significantly. When in this environment, uh, and especially given that historically, uh, over the last 
20 years prior to 2016, which is when I became the chairman of the Economic Growth Council. Jamaica showed a GDP growth rate of 0.5%, the worst in the Western Hemisphere. The 10 years prior to 2016, we showed a growth rate of 0.2%. It stepped down, wow. the absolute worst in the Western Hemisphere. But at that point, I can remember, we're doing a roadshow. We're looking at taking the National Commercial Bank, NCD, right. uh, doing an IPO on the, the New York Stock Exchange. So we did 66 uh, interviews or presentations in 10 days in London, New York, Los Angeles, Toronto. Wow. In London, in 2013, May of 2013, the uh, response was, Mike, NCB, beautiful, con uh, beautiful house, bad neighborhood. <laughs> wow. Went to New York, NCB, Beautiful house, bad zip code. Wow. 2013, March of May of 2013. Coincidentally, that's five years ago. Coincidentally, six years ago. Coincidentally, Bloomberg came out uh, in December of 2018, and the, well, January of 2018, and they said the number one stock exchange in the world in 2018 was Jamaica. And the number one stock exchange five, over the last five years from 2013 <laughs> to 2018 was in Jamaica, Jamaica, showing a cumulative rate of return of 233% profit, right? right? Appreciation. The coincidence was when we were doing the roadshow was 2013, that's when they were saying bad neighborhood, bad zip code. Right. So probably that is confirmation that you should look for the words. Don't look for perfection. They look for perfection. You're going to pay for perfection, pay for perfection. Right? But the only caveat to that is uh, when you look, when you're in an in inefficient uh, uh, environment, you have to make sure that the will is there, whether government will or, or whatever will, bureaucratic will, to change right. from the, from change that situation. So Jamaica today, uh, we're, we, we are... Uh, in 2018, we showed a growth rate of 1.8%, which is nine times the 10-year average. Wow. So, and there's a there's the confidence rate in Jamaica is high as it has ever been historically. Debt to GDP has come from 147%. It's now 96%. Right. And heading down to 60. And heading exactly. Uh, NIR strongest it has ever been. Uh, inflation has come from probably. Twelve uh, percent is now down to less than two percent. So the government has is really business friendly, and is really uh, has uh, accepted the, the, the stringencies from the IMF, and has done a remarkable job at uh, imposing fiscal discipline on ourselves. No, and, and I love that because we, we get to know we have models for Greece and all these other countries that have had problems. But Greece, Greece got off. They easy got them easy. Because the primary uh, uh, surplus. Uh, primary surplus for uh, for Jamaica was seven percent. That's what IMS imposed. Yes. Greece was one. One. But it was good because the pain was bitter initially, but it, 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 it that's the reason why we paid on debt so quickly. So, quickly. so we suffered the short term medicine. Right. And we're now reaping the long term Benefit. benefits. And we see the difference between us and Greece now. So so one of the things I always spoke about. Fortunately or unfortunately, I've had to follow you a few times. So by the UE Leeds NCB sponsored, you spoke the first year, I had to speak the second year. Jamaica Stock Exchange, you spoke, <laughs> I've spoken. And I never forget when I had spoken to them, I reminded our audience that Jamaica used to be on top of the world, certainly in the Western Hemisphere. We have the seventh largest natural harbor in the world, just like Singapore is next door to a big country, China. We have the US, they have a big harbor. You know, we talk about Port Royal and Boston used to be the two richest cities in the world in the 1400s. You come from Portland, so you know this. I mean, we supplied what, like 40% of the bananas in the world at one point, Greed Bowl. <coughs> what has happened that you think led to where we went down? But now, can we actually become a Singapore of the West or, or something different, but on that level? You know, I was fortunate in that in 1969, I left high school. And I was able to get a job because 
in 1969 for GDP growth was 5.97%. 1970, I was able to keep my job because growth in Jamaica in 1970 was 11.9%. Double digits. Double, exactly. That's in 1970. So I was fortunate. So I have reaped the benefit of growth. Now, the problem is, I have, a, I have a mantra, and it goes like this. Success begets complacency, begets failure. So we became complacent, and the rot set in. Right? We became complacent. So we are now cleaning up 40 years of rot. Wow. Right? Which is where the opportunity is. Because we are, if, 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 we were, if you parachuted your home from Jamaica and drop it in Cayman, it would be worth five to ten times. That's true. Right? But again, we are now, we are now the second point is people don't change when they are self satisfied. You change only when you're disgusted with yourself. We became disgusted with ourselves in 2013. We say we're bright. Yes, still, we have the worst track record for GDP growth in the Western Hemisphere. How bright could we be? Exactly. So that was the disgust we had in ourselves. <laughs> and when you're disgusted, that's when you're open to change. And that's the reason why we, were, we, 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 we brought our economic matrix in, uh, in, in line with, uh, uh, in, in fact, our, our passing of IMF tests is a model within the IMF, <laughs> the realm of IMF countries. Right. It has never happened so consistently. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I've studied that you shared with me a number of times, and every article anybody can see, they talk about it, but it's your, your five, I don't even want to call them preconditions, a framework when we think of wealthy people. So, so we don't want people <laughs> to think of you, but I mean, you are literally on the Forbes list. When we look at the black billionaires in the world, Forbes estimates 2.2, but you're in a lot of private stuff. We're probably doing more than that. We don't have to get into it's that. It says 2.2 and you're somewhere in the 1300s. But that's, this is alongside people like Robert Frederick Smith and Oprah Winfrey and mm -hmm. Dan Gauthier. And for you to be spending so much time in Jamaica for me is amazing. Well, you point out to us, think of anybody on the Forbes list, on the wealth, like let's think about real wealth. And they say number one is that the person has a few businesses, mm -hmm. probably private. Yes. Right? Number two yes. is that they're domiciled in strong long-term growth industries. Yes. Number three, they understand the business. Yes. And, and usually those businesses are run by mm -hmm. uh, management that they trust mm -hmm. and is also highly concentrated in ownership. So they run like private family run business. Yes. They're going to feel paid. Right. Uh, number four is that they use other people's money very well. Prudent managers of capital. Am I yes. getting those right? Perfect. And then the most important one, though, that most yes. people forget is that we have to hold it for the long term. Yes. And so. You think that we can use that same framework in Jamaica, and I think you've proven it when Columbus Communications, I'd love for you to talk about that specific deal that they had done and how that had fit in with their framework. Well, first, uh, Columbus Communications is a perfect example of the three preconditions that we mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, uh, at the time, so we, we owned a company called Cable Bahamas, 35% of Cable Bahamas, and Cable Bahamas provided uh, cable services to the Bahamian people. So being an incumbent operator, an in-market operator, we uh, we were being charged uh, $48,000 per month for a T1 data line. Oh. Now, we said, we're, we're from Canada. This thing costs in the hundreds of dollars or less than a thousand, right? $48,000 a month? We said, no, 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 no. We aren't going to pay that. We're going to build an undersea cable from uh, Boca Raton to Freeport. So when we, we made the announcement, uh, uh, the incumbent teleco dropped the price from $48,000 per month to $24,000 per month. Wow. When we landed, they dropped the price further from 24 to 16 and 12. We came in at six <laughs> and we grabbed 60% market share. That gave us a taste of the business. So, wow, this is a great business. You lay the cable, put out major capex, and then the operational expenditure to maintain it, right. not much, right? But you know, start uh, getting revenues and your margins 
are, are, are increase, right? Are increasing. So Jamaica came out with an RFP and uh, for a second uh, cable outlet from Jamaica, undersea cable from Jamaica. So we made a bid for it. Right. We won it. So we now search through the, the, the Caribbean to see uh, how if there are any stranded assets, and we came up, we came across the Arcos network, which Motorola in the late 1990s spent 450 million US dollars laying the, the, the undersea cable from, and it went from Boca Raton to Cancun, Mexico, and it hops to every single Central American com country up the Eastern Caribbean, passes through that, uh, uh, Easter, uh, Barbados, Dominican Republic, uh, back to US Virgin Island, back to Miami. So it was a complete rig. Uh, they paid four fifty. It was and in two thousand and in the early two thousand, we didn't have uh, smartphones. No, we didn't right. have Google. We didn't have no Facebook. Netflix, so, right. No Netflix. So down the broadband traffic was low. So the highway was built, but there was no traffic. So it went bankrupt. No different from Bluebell Crossing. This was the Caribbean Crossing. Right. So we bought it for eighty million. They spent four hundred fifty. We bought it for eighty. We uh, rehabilitated it, and that, that became our wholesale uh, uh, teleco business, oh. right? Then we superimposed on top of that uh, a retail business where we started selling, doing the triple play. All right. Right? Uh, that this, this was back in 2005, six. In 2013, we sold that business to Cape and Wireless uh, for three. It was the largest transaction in Latin America in 2013. We sold the Cuban wireless for $3 billion. Wow. So people think the Caribbean doesn't have scalable investment, investment. but that's not true. That's, that's one opportunity. Digicel. Digicel is another op uh, opportunity that was started by Mr. Dennis O'Brien in 2001. Right. Digicel is now worth multi-billion. NCB. When I bought NCB, the market cap of NCB was 200 million. Today, today's uh, market cap of NCB is probably about 3.2 billion US. Right. And I'd love since you bring up NCB and the market cap. We obviously we grew up loving Warren Buffett. You have told yes. me in the past. The first thing you ever told me was David needs to find a role model, get the recipe, don't change the recipe until you exceed the role model. And so I think we have similar role <laughs> models. And so when you talk about that NCB versus S&P 500 versus Berkshire, you showed me a graph recently and it, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Can you just go over the growth that you've seen over that time? Well, if you had, uh, in the, if you had a hundred thousand dollars back in 2002, right. you had many alternatives. One of which would have been, you could have invested in the S&P 500. So a hundred thousand would be worth $322,000 today. today. Most money managers would have done less, less. than the, the S&P 500. You could have taken your 100,000 and bought uh, J, uh, the J, uh, Morgan Stanley Emerging Markets Index. It would be worth $429,000 today. You could have taken your 100,000 and bought, bought Berkshire Hathaway. Right. It would be worth $422,000. And by the way, it's not today. It's as of last December. Right. Uh, it would have been worth, Berkshire would be worth $422,000. Had you taken the, the hundred thousand and bought NCB, you'd be worth in US dollars, it would be worth two point two million dollars as of last December. As of today, two point five, two point six million million dollars from a hundred thousand. Yes. That so so that proves the point. Proof of point. Proof proof of the point. Proofs will be number one. The JSC, Jamaica Stock Exchange, being right. number one. Uh, NCB's performance in an inefficient market. Wow. So, so you know what we're planning to do. We're raising equity capital in the United States to bring down here to invest in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean, but Jamaica is a beachhead. Using those frameworks, you think that this is the right time for people to be looking at those kind of opportunities? Well, uh, there are very few opportunities in the world whereby you, you you should have confidence in the, in the legal framework. Right. Right? right. Jamaica's legal framework is British. Uh, Jamaica, by virtue of its location, right, is ideally located. And th th there's no reason why, given Jamaica's location, you need, need the Panama Canal, the first country you're seeing. If, you're, if you keep going straight, 
you you <laughs> run right into Jamaica. Right into Jamaica. Uh, so, so so we have large population, relatively large population, three million people. So it's not small, That's right? Small population wise, good great landmass, natural resources, time zone, and good pro proximity to the strongest markets in the world. Right. So there is South America. So there is no reason why Jamaica should not be the Singapore of the Western Hemisphere. And the Chinese look at it that way, because as we speak, they are uh, in the middle of implementing six billion US dollars. US. US in St. Elizabeth, Jamaica, starting with a power plant of revival of, their, of, of, the, of the bauxite aluminum company, then building a power plant, and then going to build a light industry, uh, a city that revolves around light industries right. uh, with light aluminum, wow. light manufacturing with aluminum products. And I remember growing up, dad would always tell me, which you, you met him, and, and so that was amazing. First of all, I want to say thank you for giving your time. Uh, like when we met, he had, it was about the Portland Indian Fund, and dad asked you, after you called him out about the five frameworks, you had to think of someone, and he specifically I spoke to him afterwards. He said, I'm about to retire in a few years. Could I get some advice? And you spent 35 minutes with him one on one. So, so that was amazing. And, and that gave me insight into you as a person, you know, giving back, paying it forward. But one of the things that I always said was that the reason our bauxite industry was just extractive, just the red dirt, and then we ship off the ore, was because electricity was so expensive in Jamaica. But now that the Chinese are going to have their own <coughs> power plant that brings on the cost, so they can actually have an aluminum smelter and we can move up the value chain. Right. And so the same thing now we just opened up a massive power plant, solar power plant that's now plugged into the grid. I think that's at like eight cents or something per kilowatt hour. Some yes. It's not double digits that we're used to. So that's amazing. <laughs> we have a wind farm that the government just went public. I'd love for you to talk about that diversification of assets, uh, divesting of assets. The government is saying 